I became essentially what we consider like an overachiever in an attempt to fit in, to find my place in space. I went from a high school dropout to a university professor by 27. I went from, you know, someone who really struggled with addictions to somebody who was running marathons. So I just went to the, almost like the opposite end of the extreme. Uh, Hi, Dr. Robin. Thank you so much for doing this. It's an honor. As I mentioned to you a minute ago, I've been hearing your voice in my ear for the past couple of weeks as I was listening to your book and preparing for this. So it's nice to hear your voice now. And can you please introduce yourself in your own way? And maybe (laughs) you mentioned how much detail, as much detail as you want. (laughs) I'll interrupt at any point if I think I'm, I guess, start to get curious or want some clarification. Um, But yeah, how did you get to be sitting here right now today. There you go. Well, first, Mike, thank you for the opportunity to join you and your listeners Mm -hmm. today. I feel very fortunate. Um, So yeah, my name is Robin. I'm somebody who studies human resiliency and wellness and stress. And I actually have been studying this now almost for two decades. So I've been quite immersed in the kind of academic side of this and the practical side, learning about how we kind of show up in difficult times in our lives and what that looks like for different people. And interestingly, it comes at that interest in studying this comes from a lot of personal experience. And Mm. I share quite candidly in all my work that I was a a teenager who was in a very dark season. And I was a teenager who really struggled with school addictions, mental health, emotional health, just really was, you know, struggling to find my way. And I often let folks know, you know, when we're struggling as teenagers, we often ask for help in all of the wrong ways. And that very much is what I I did for many years. And what was significant in my own story was experiencing a pretty catastrophic car accident at 16, which just really was like hitting this like reset switch where it started me to kind of realize that I didn't want to show up like this anymore, that I wanted to get well. And I started to do the work. And for me, education became the key of getting back into school and studying about human resiliency and wellness and stress management. And that really kind of catapulted a career where I've been able to study this for the last 20 years. And uh, and probably the most important thing I would share about myself is I'm, I'm a mom of three teenagers, so I am still learning every single day. Thank you. Great. And you detail a lot of great stories about being a mom. And and I just thought of the one where your son got lost in the running yeah. event or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and so I guess going from the accident and then and that sort of what set you on this trajectory, mm-hmm. you also kind of describe in the book how you developed a sense of yourself and the balance between striving for acceptance or to be validated and fighting. I don't know what words you would use exactly, but I guess struggling with society or your teachers or the people around you's perspective of you, you talk a lot about how we often absorb narratives or words that other people use to describe us. And can you maybe paint the picture of how you did go from that maybe a little bit more detail, um, post-secondary work, academic work, and how you got to writing the book, which really ultimately is what we're talking about, Stress Wisely. Yeah, of course, I'd be happy to. So one of the things I, I talk very openly about in all of my work, and one of the things that's important to me as an educator is not only to braid our research and theory and practice, but also can add that piece around our personal stories and, and this kind of idea of our knowledge and context. Mm. So it's one thing to like read about, you know, a person who struggled academically. Um, I was somebody who has ADHD. I have learning disabilities. That wasn't discussed when I was a child. Those were things that we weren't talking about. Um, I I think maybe perhaps we were starting to think about maybe young boys with ADHD or ADD, but it was definitely not something that we explored with girls. So again, I was just trying to always compensate, uh, given that I see the world differently, feel the world differently. Again, it was just an attempt to try and fit in and find my way in a world that isn't designed for anyone who kind of thinks outside of the box or looks at the world in a different way. 
way. Mm -hmm. And I think what happens a lot of time is we develop these maladaptive ways of showing up. And I very much did develop these maladaptive practices as a teenager. And what I really try to emphasize in the book is once I did have that kind of start my recovery and went through the interventions and started to get myself back on track, what's really kind of, I think, fundamental is the fact that a lot of those drivers of wanting to fit in and to belong very much propelled me on the other side of it, Mike, where I became essentially what we consider like an overachiever in an attempt to to fit in, to find my place in space. So I can share with you in a very short time, I went from a high school dropout to a university professor by 27. I went from, you know, someone who really struggled with addictions to somebody who was running marathons. So I just went to the almost like the opposite end of the extreme. And what was interesting in that season in my life, Mike, the world like congratulated me. They like celebrated, like I was doing all this great work, but underneath I was still the same person who was listening to those labels that I wasn't smart enough, that I wasn't good enough. I had to earn my worth. So again, it was just almost as if it was like a reckoning when I realized, yeah, that was pretty maladaptive. This success early on in my career was also maladaptive for different reasons. So then I had to start doing that heart work and started revisiting how do we start to create new narratives to help us understand who we are and who we are not. Hmm. Yeah, nice. Thank you for sharing that. And maybe just to linger on the ADHD thing a little bit, yeah. I also have ADHD. I work part-time in a clinic that specializes in treating ADHD. Yes. And I'm very curious. I always find it amazing how people get to a place where you're at Mm -hmm. And I think I'm inspired by you and, and sort of all the work you've managed mm -hmm. to do, knowing kind of how hard it is to sit down and do writing and, and academic work is difficult. So how did you or what have you done to help with the ADHD side of things? And, yeah, it's and, a really great question. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. Uh, I can share with you, I think um, I believe that ADHD manifests very differently from different people and mm -hmm. for different people, mm -hmm. depending on our lived experience. And what I mean by that is we can have like similar symptoms, yet how we feel them or how it impacts us might look different. So one of the things that I learned very early on once I was, you know, formally diagnosed was my, my hyper focus actually could be an asset when I learned how to use it correctly. Now, I think often when we think about ADHD, we think of that distractibility. But in my case, it's almost as if it's more like a time blindness. So I can start doing a task and I could miss all of the cues that says, okay, Robin, it's time to move on to the other task. And right. I can stay really tunnel focused in these places and spaces. So once I started to learn, how do I use that to actually help me work towards my academic pursuits? And I'll give you an example. So when I went into, when I started my graduate work at the time, I already had my first child. And I would have these little windows where I would have childcare, which meant I could get all my course reading and my writing done, but I would only have these four hour blocks. And so it was literally like shut everything down. My little guy was looked after and then four hours, it was just hyper focus. And I was able to do like a day plus amount of work mm -hmm. in those four hours because that's all that I had to work with. So it was learning strategies and techniques on how to use some of those kind of parts of our ADHD, which sometimes can be misunderstood to like actually learn how to harness it to help us meet our goals. Wow. Were those self-developed? Did you have guidance from therapy or doctors or like, how did you figure out those strategies? Because it wasn't until I started, I guess, doing therapy for people with ADHD specifically that I even started treating parts of my own ADHD yeah. with some of those strategies. But yeah, how did you figure those things out? Good question. Again, uh, so for me, it was it was mostly through active discovery. It was like figuring out what was working, what wasn't working, right. and really starting to. I re I recall years ago um, working with a, a coach, and it was actually around like physical pursuit, so it wasn't around mm -hmm. academic pursuits. But I was training for a marathon, and I remember my coach asking me, you know, Robin, when do you feel the most effective? to be able to do this training? Like when are those kind of peak windows where you feel as though like, yes, this is where I feel like I can get this training in. And I remember just almost taking that question, like and generalizing it out broadly to think, okay, when am I the most effective at my job? When am I the most effective as a parent, as a partner, as a daughter? 
And some of the kind of patterns that I learned through that kind of reflection was as long as I found some type of an activity that I could essentially like really get that hyper focus, I found mm -hmm. afterwards, I felt really kind of like I had capacity to manage my days better. Mm -hmm. So what that kind of translated into is realizing like I really needed to have a solid morning routine. Like if I could have a really solid morning routine and I could be consistent I got the guesswork out of, do I feel like doing it this morning? Which I don't think we ever feel like doing the good things for ourselves in the morning, but it just became a, it, a discipline of knowing that when I do these like really kind of standardized or like these really solid practices consistently, the benefits compounded. And then I realized mm -hmm. I was, it was easier to manage my day as it unfolded. And totally curious question. Yeah, Are course. you familiar with Cal Newport's work? No, I, I've heard no, the name, okay. but I haven't. Oh, have you? Okay, cool. Have, yeah. He, yeah. It's been very helpful for me as like a yeah. time block calendar workbook yes. kind of thing. And, and anyway, it's just that in the realm of how do you protect ourselves from getting distracted and, yeah. and set aside the time. Wow. And your work, maybe, maybe you can summarize the book a little bit uh, and then I can kind of be my curious self and ask you questions about it. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Absolutely. So, so the book, this book is a, it's my second book. My first book uh, was called, um, it was Everyday Resiliency, how to be, um, and it was this kind of idea of like setting the stage, Mike, really of what human resiliency looks like and very much what my recovery looked like. So again, braiding that personal story with the theory we developed. And then with Stress Wisely, the new book that we're chatting about today, this was very much this um, attempt to look at this kind of proactive approach about managing our wellness in a really sustainable way. And what I found personally was that there was so much information about stress management and wellness that it wasn't about like, you know, finding or accessing information, Mike. Mm -hmm. It was like, I needed to find a way to discern what makes sense for me? What makes sense for people? And when should we be doing these things? And how does it all fit together in very full lives? So what we dived into that research thinking about is like, how do we sustain real wellness? And like, how do people actually get to the place where they're like enjoying their lives? Hmm. And the big idea that really kind of sparked this was working with groups all around the world and just recognizing that, you know, we're all trying to live the dream, yet living the dream shouldn't kill us. And people were so unwell in these very successful lives. Mm -hmm. So we, again, that's what kind of started that thinking about it. And again, resiliency, we often talk about is bouncing back, right? So bad things have happened and now we try to bounce back. But I wanted to take a proactive approach around how do we like create a hedge of protection around these lives that we get to co-create so that way we can be well in the process. And in our research, what we did come upon, the folks who are able to really live well and feel well are persons who essentially looked after these eight areas of their life. So Stress Wisely is this constellation of ways that we can look after these eight unique areas in our lives so we can really stress well to live well. And do you recall those eight can you rhyme of them course. off yeah, yeah of can you yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah i'm yeah, impressed yeah. i'm impressed yeah. i was just gonna bring up the book and look at them yeah if you can remember yeah. them of course yeah so <laughs> the first one we talk about is the physical self right so that's yeah. like the sleep nutrition exercise the absence of disease most often what we think about when we think about health and wellness it's our physical bodies so we know that's an important part of it absolutely but what we also came upon is that our emotional self has to get looked after too. Like that idea of our relationship with our feelings and our emotions and mm -hmm. essentially learning how to work with our emotions as an ally. The other six that we talk about is mm -hmm. the intellectual, like this idea about how we see the world, how we interpret the world, how we think, uh, critical thinking, all of those beautiful things, the quality of our thoughts and our thinking matter, given that they're so interconnected with our mm -hmm. feelings and our feelings are so interconnected with our actions and our behavior. So those were kind of like the three first realms mm -hmm. that we explored. And then as we dove into that, Mike, we discovered that our communities, our social health, our social systems really had an impact on our health, as well as our environments, how we, where we live, how we live within our environments, uh, you know, that on a micro and a macro level in terms of all the way from our homes to our planet, 
We also then uncovered the importance around our occupational health and our financial health, as well as our spiritual health. Mm. And what was what, quite encouraging, I think, is all of a sudden we came upon this idea that each of these realms were really important. And then my first thought was it would be a full-time job to manage our wellness in each one of those eight areas, that that feels like it wouldn't be possible. But what we later discovered, it's persons who put just a wee bit of attention at the right time in each one of those eight. So in some cases, it's actually doing less, but with just more clarity as to why I'm doing this behavior actually allowed people to really start to slow down and enjoy their lives and be well again. Hmm. Yeah, that's so nice. So you mentioned, I heard a saying once, we have all the ingredients, we don't have the recipe. Yeah. And this is a kind of what you're describing is there's so much out there, but really what matters is that we integrate it into a way that makes sense for us. And yeah. you outlined the domains. I can never stop this, not that I'm really trying to stop it, but when I come across research or books or people talking about all these things, even as a therapist too, mm -hmm. and maybe even as a consumer of therapy services, mm -hmm. it seems that we've known all of these things for thousands of years. Yeah, <laughs> like, definitely. So I'm curious how people like yourself who are academically inclined and kind of you, you play the personal, the academic, the professional, the coaching or the leadership yeah. training, all that kind of stuff. Why, I don't even know really what my question is, but, and it might be my own uh, projection, but it seems like we talk about these things as if they're new discoveries, mm. which yeah. often, which often I think puts the thought in people's head that, oh, I just don't know what it is. Like I need to discover the answer to my problems yet. Mm. So many, and you mentioned this throughout the books too, throughout the book is, we have these things in us already Yes. Um, a lot of times, right? Or we know ourselves better than others, obviously. But yeah, so it's a bit of a jumbled question. I but love I, it. I get it's it. hard to, yeah, okay. Yeah, I can jump <laughs> yeah. in here. So I can pull on a few threads that you introduced. Okay. Okay. So the first one is the reality is, yes, knowledge, especially truth, right? That's right. going to permeate different lifespans. Like that is going to stand right. the test of time. That's why these are almost familiar concepts that we talk right, about. Right, like, right, right, you know, right. if we talk about like, you know, the great philosophers were talking yeah. about these things, you know, people through mm -hmm. all of the ages have been talking about the importance of these things. Why I think it's really unique to us in where we find ourselves in history is this idea that our perspective grows in relation to our lived experience. So we actually have to like live and we need to actually have these, <laughs> this knowledge and right. we do need to have this kind of making it make sense to us in context. So right. again, yes, all that information is out there, but it's kind of the idea that in rest, we're ready to look for it. And when we mm -hmm. kind of need mm -hmm. to hear it, we don't mm -hmm. really pay attention to it in the same way. And I can give you an example. Like I remember when my daughter started to drive and, uh, you know, she said all of a sudden, she's like, wow, like, she's like, how will I possibly know where that is? And I, you know, this street, she was trying to find an address. And I said, well, you know, like all of the streets have names. And she's like, oh, I never noticed that. I'm like, but you know that, like intuitively, you know, right, right. you have an address, you know, there are street signs everywhere. But until she started to drive, like it wasn't information that she needed to focus on. So I think what happens is it's all out there, but it's not mm -hmm. until we actually have a need for it that do we actually come onto that place of actually mm -hmm. internalizing that knowledge. Right. Yeah, that's great. And that's helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. One thing I was curious about, you didn't touch on social media so much, mm -hmm. how that impacts people. And I'm curious if that was a conscious decision or maybe that didn't come up in your research per se, but maybe you could touch on that a little bit. And then maybe I think that fits into something you bring up in the book, which I think is such a big challenge for people is the awareness. So you talk about global warming and sort of some of the students you've worked with and, or like in your classes and the conversations around that. So maybe how does social media impact wellness and resiliency? Yeah. And maybe if it does influence the doom and gloom stories we tell ourselves about global warming or any other societal problem. Yeah. And then, one 
yeah. yeah, how people work through that, I guess. Yeah, one hundred percent. So, um, so we talk a wee bit about the the idea yeah. about the impacts of social media, and and the reality is, I think that we all are at a point where we understand that this is yet again just another form of, you know, behavior that people are doing that can either be positive or negative. It's either helping you towards your goals or it's hindering your advancement. So any type of behavior can become maladaptive and every behavior serves a purpose. So we didn't put too much of a spotlight on the social media because like we we know what it is. We know that it can be used for good and we know it can be used <laughs> in, a, in a harmful way. What we did really kind of focus on when we think about this are those behaviors again that actually add, you know, this sense of us feeling better. And often when I'm, you know, if we think about social media, one of the questions I often ask my, you know, my own teenagers is like, after you've experienced some time on social media, like, how do you feel? And often they'll share like, not great, right? Yeah. So it's one of those things where we, we you know, there's a lot of really great people that are talking about like ways sure. of interacting yeah. with social media. Um, the gentle kind of invitation I talk about is the reality is it could be used for good. It could be used in a negative way. We want to make sure it's as adaptable as possible and not as maladaptive and minimize the maladaptiveness. Mm -hmm. But again, it's a tool and it's the same as all the other kind of tools out there that we use. Now, one of the things, though, that we did very much see in our research, and I see this when I work with people as well, is that there's a numbing effect that happens when we are constantly bombarded with negative messaging. And what I mean by that is it's, we kind of talk, you know, we talk briefly about that idea of it, you know, it hits almost like a compassion fatigue yeah. where we just, we don't have any more cares to give when we hear about, you know, for example, right now in Canada, a lot of Canada is being impacted by wildfires this season. And, you know, you hear like, oh, there's another wildfire. There's another wildfire to the point where people don't seem to really care anymore hmm. because it just seems so prevalent. And I think, unfortunately, when we think of things like climate change and we are seeing that uh, people are becoming almost desensitized to it because it feels as though it's a hopeless, helpless cause. And you talk, I guess, how you do provide ways out of that in the book, like as you're talking about that specifically, and I don't want to get into it too much, but the politicization of everything, particularly global warming has gets in the way. And yeah, and maybe if you could, if you have a thought on that or not. Yeah. Uh, and then also in the book, you discuss kind of how might people take action on that numbness or that mm -hmm. ap apathy or whatever they experience. Absolutely. And again, to kind of kind of almost like a zoom in, zoom out approach to talking yeah. about this and answering your question. When we zoom out, when we see people pitted against each other, whether we call it, you know, if it is, you know, the political kind of right, disconnect right, yeah. or whatever that is, when people are against each other and us versus them mentality, we know that's a stress response. It's a fear response. Mm -hmm, it's this mm -hmm, idea mm -hmm. of, you know, that group think where, you know, we're safest if we kind of like, you know, kind of hold all the resources together and we look after ourselves. And again, that's a, that's a stress behavior. It's, you know, highly symptomatic of people who are extremely dysregulated when we kind of fall, when we start to see people kind of living in those extremes. And I think what's really important is to, to, to recognize that regardless of our opinion of things of climate change, there's enough evidence to demonstrate that there is something afoot. And the way that we start to acknowledge and recognize some of these, in, you know, climate change or even social injustices, it's actually raising it to our awareness because often we can be on autopilot and we kind of be, are a bystander to all of these things. And we think that's somebody else's problem or like, we don't have to worry about that. But once we take that personal ownership, of understanding how I contribute to these systems. And we start, you know, for example, with climate change, exploring, you know, self-stewardship. Like how do we even take care of our land? How do we, how do we, you know, engage as consumers? What do we buy? What do we support? That's when we start to build this awareness and we have to be able to see it to be able to fix it. How do you balance that awareness with, I talk about this with one of my colleagues all the time. I think due to my own journey, in addiction recovery, it is just hammered into our head that we're responsible for our behavior and really nothing else matters other than that, which which I think also has been, that idea has been around for thousands of years. How do we, or how do you think about the balance between that reality and our social response or collective global 
societal responsibility to do these things. And for whatever people think about this person, I think Elon Musk, you know, might be one example of of a way out there person who I guess has dedicated his life to creating products that help address some of these things. So that person, he's way on the, you know, taking action side of things. But I guess, yeah, how do you kind of think about that gap and like where maybe our focus is lost and maybe where we can re- focus our efforts. Yeah, I appreciate that question. And and where how I would like how I see this and interpret it actually yeah. has to do um, with the research that I've done on resiliency. And I'll okay. give you the example where, yeah, there's a component of extreme ownership when it comes yeah. to our resiliency in the sense that no one is going to fix this for us. Right, no one's coming right. to rescue us. No yeah, one is yeah. going to somehow <laughs> write the past. And now we are going to be okay. So there is a personal component with that extreme ownership when it comes to your resiliency that right. no one can do the work but you. And the dual truth, Mike, is that there's also system issues that yeah. are requiring people to be resilient. And what I mean by that is that the question isn't you know so much as, let's say, in the workplace. Yeah. Let's say we're in a very toxic work culture. And the leader or the boss says, you know, you need to be more resilient to the Mm -hmm, staff mm -hmm, versus mm -hmm. how about the leadership stops putting us in positions that require us to be that resilient to be able to do our jobs. So there's a dual truth to this where, yes, we have our own personal accountability and responsibility. And there is that collective responsibility that we live and we work within systems that are requiring us to be that resilient. So that's how I kind of view and how I kind of reconcile that idea that there's a dual truth there. And there's those two places, which I think are really important to operate. And, you know, an example, um, you know, I can share with you is recently I was talking to a senior leader and he was interviewing someone for a VP position at a very prestigious company. And the, the, the panel asked the candidate, um, they asked the candidate, like, why should we hire you? And the candidate turned the question around and said, why should I work for you given that you have gone through three VPs in one year? (laughs) And, and what was so interesting, like what a bold position to be in to say that in a recruiting Mm -hmm. panel, Mm -hmm. but just that idea that like, yeah, you know, why should I, what am I bringing to this job? But why are you going through VPs as quickly as you're going through VPs? And it just opened up a very interesting dialogue as to what was really going on versus what was needed in these roles. So I think, again, that dual truth, understanding that responsibility is important. Yeah, that's a great example. It's also a good example of, I don't even know how to put words to it, but so that's an example of that person, or or if you are in a toxic workplace, if if it is that way, generally unless there's some sort of divine intervention, the leadership is rarely going to have a moment of insight to be aware that, yeah, maybe they're creating the toxic environment. Mm -hmm. And then you give this example of that person, I guess, taking it upon themselves to point out that there could be a problem here. And that takes a lot of courage, obviously, Mm -hmm. which I also have so many conversations where there's that dynamic going on and it's hard to accept the fact that if you're in an environment like that, it's still your responsibility to either remove yourself from it or to say something. Yes. And that also is difficult for people that really have limited options or they resources reason, yeah. or they come from yeah. places that, you know, they, in some sense, they're forced into putting up with that kind of stuff. Oh, 100%. There's enormous amounts of privilege embedded in being courageous. Like, I think that's something that is so often not discussed. So I really appreciate you flagging that. You know, when we tell people like, oh, you have to stand up. If that's their only way of supporting their family, advocating and standing up isn't available to them right then. Like that's not available because that's the only way they're looking after their loved ones. One of the things that we we often talk about and why this kind of connects to the book in Stress Wisely, I think so many people, when we think about our nervous system, like we're really familiar with like the traditional fight or flight system that's activated, that's trying to get us out of danger. Like we're pretty familiar with that. We talk about that quite readily. The two subsystems though, that I feel like don't get a lot of attention are the freezing response. And that freezing response is people just don't do anything. And like Mm -hmm. decades of their life could go by and they just don't 
ever do anything different. Like they just kind of accept it. And it's like, they have no agency to make change. And the second subsystem is the fawning. And fawning is essentially when our body decides to placate and it just kind of surrenders to whatever's going on because the it's the brain's way of interpreting the greatest chance of my survival right now is just to people please. My greatest chance of my survival right now is just to like make this stop by just saying, okay. And I think right now when we see how depleted people are and how many people are living in this place of distress, we're seeing a lot of fawning behavior and freezing behavior more than we're seeing the fight or flight behavior. I'm so glad you brought that up. That was another thing in the book that there was so much in there. So uh, (laughs) as I understand the fight, flight, freeze thing, and I think this from one of the, I guess, best or most renowned neuroscientists. I think it's Ledoux. His name is Ledoux. I can't remember exactly. He says we free like animals freeze first to figure out what to do. Then we flee. Then we fight. Something mm-hmm. like that. I'm curious. I've heard this fawning thing come up and that, that uh, triggers my, uh, I don't know what it is, where sometimes I, I have this weird relationship to what I perceive as, I don't know what it is, um, not pop psychology, but another way to describe something that we already know, which I think uh, just helped me connect the dot to probably why that bothers me (laughs) Uh, (laughs) or why I have a reaction to it. Um, Mm -hmm. So do you know neurobiologically as well as we understand it? Is the fawning thing like an actual, actually we know it as it's the threat response And I think you mentioned this in the book too, then it's how we interpret the threat that leads to the, um, so is the fawning thing just like another way to help people understand what's happening to them or is it really like a neuroscientific thing? Yeah. So, so again, both. So uh, there is like, there is a physiological component to fawning. So I I hear what you say and I feel similarly where, you know, all of a sudden people, you know, attach onto these ideas and now it's like new psychology and it's like, well, no, this is behaviorism. And we've been talking right, right. about it for okay, 50 okay. years. So right. I totally appreciate where you feel of maybe right. some of that like discomfort yeah, of just these new like ideas, yeah. 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 trying to explain things that we already right. know quite a bit about under different names. Uh, so right. I get that. So I hold space okay. for you on that one. <laughs> the fawning though is a physiological <laughs> yeah. response. And I think the easiest one that we can recognize in the natural environment would be like uh-huh. a dog rolling over and exposing their tummy, okay. right? Where it's, if, you know, a big scary dog comes chasing another dog, yeah. you yeah. know, one dog is going to like nip or bet, bite back. One dog will run away, hide. Um, another dog might just freeze. And then you're going to have the dog that like hits the ground, rolls over and is like, I surrender. Right. Right, So, so we know it is in the natural world that some animals and from a biological perspective use this as a strategy. Now, I think where there's a parallel in psychology, where I would say it's probably the most related to Mike is maybe what some people might've called learned helplessness Mm. that some people just learn to kind of placate. And then that behavior gets reinforced. But I think the big idea though, is that, and this is what I talk a lot about in chapter three is that we don't get to pick what our bodies do. Mm. It would be amazing Mm. if we all could be these like Spartan warriors in stressful situations and we feel emboldened and we stand up for what's right and what's just and what's true. Other times though, the reality is like our brain will interpret what's going on and it will make a very, very quick decision. And we are either going to fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. And so what I really try to emphasize in the book, it's not what's good or bad about those reactions because they're biological, they're like reflexes. What's important is what do we do with it? What, what, what do we do next? What's the next right move after we've noticed we fawned or after we noticed that we're getting really aggressive and we're being really confrontational? So again, it's that awareness piece of after we have the reflex of one of those four responses, what do we do next? What's our next right choice in that moment? That's great. And maybe that brings me into you gave a great uh, description of someone who's learning or beginning a meditation practice when you said you went to your first retreat. (laughs) That was amazing. Uh, I'm very huge part of my own journey and practice and recovery is, is mindfulness and having great teachers and places to learn, which fits into what you're saying right now. It's sort of, and I like, I really like you point that out too. 
it's so helpful for people to understand. We don't per se choose our automatic responses. They right. just happen, right? It's yeah. like, what do we do when they happen or when we can yeah. bring awareness to them? Can you talk a little bit about that story of when you went to the retreat and started learning about just how yeah. I like the word crazy our minds are or how all over oh, the place absolutely. our minds are and how you came into and then how that fits into what you just said about the uh, learning to respond. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And again, so one of the things we, we often talk about, especially given that I spend a lot of time with education and learning, we talk about like learning styles. Mm -hmm. And recently I was asked, you know, Robin, what's your learning style? And my learning style is the hard way. Like I have learned everything <laughs> the hard way. I'm not an auditory learner. I am not a hands-on learner. I am literally, is there the, the what's the hardest possible way right. that Robin can learn this lesson? And that is, that is me, that I, I identify mm -hmm. as someone who learns things the best when it hits the hardest. Mm -hmm. And I recall being told, you know, again, coming onto this research that was talking about mindfulness is so important for our wellness. It's so important, especially with persons with ADHD. It's so important for people who've had trauma, mm -hmm. recovering from addiction. So, mm -hmm. you know, the literature on mindfulness is just so convincing. Like you, you, there, there's not a lot of holes that we can poke in that research. Right. So of course it's me. So I like to do things in the extreme because there's, they're never, the extremes aren't very crowded. So I always like to show up. And in my personal case, the extreme of me learning how to meditate was not just like watching a five minute YouTube video or downloading an app. It literally was signing up for like a 72 hour meditation retreat with like masterful people at this. So this is, I think, probably like a, a master class. And I came in as the rookie thinking like immersion. I will just immerse myself in mindfulness and I will somehow pick up the skill of mindfulness. And the example I share in the book is actually being in this retreat and, you know, you know, all of a sudden the, the you know, the teacher like sets the stage and we're going to do this, you know, very short guided meditation. And I could share with you because it was the first time, Mike, that I actually sat still for probably a decade. Like it literally was probably the first time that I sat still in stillness in a decade. I, I did the first few breaths. And then, you know, by two minutes into it, I had planned a birthday party. I had like decided how I was going to renovate my house. Like I, my mind just went into a hundred different directions. And even when I would pull myself back to the teacher's voice, all of a sudden her voice and her, her guiding mm -hmm. prompts started to like create these stories in my mind and I would bring them in. And, you know, at one point, I think I share in the book, you know, she was asking us to imagine this beautiful beach. So I'm like, okay, I can imagine a beach. So I'm breathing, imagining a beach. And then all of a sudden, you know, I imagine all these little monkeys on the beach yeah, and like okay, it just yeah. turned into a circus. And in that moment, recognizing that I had kept myself busy, Mike, for so long that I had so many unresolved thoughts and feelings and ideas that I had never actually let finish, hmm. never let actually get processed, that I actually had to do some work there first before I could actually quiet the mind into stillness. So um, I'm still a rookie in the mindful category, okay. um, but I'm, hey, practice makes better. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. Progress, not perfection. That's uh, another way that yeah. I like to think about it. Um, on that note, you do such a good job too in the book of describing the personal, the collective, the bigger picture. You sort yeah. of say zooming out and zooming in. You also, or at least I assume, uh, use therapeutic frameworks, I yes. guess, to sort of yeah. describe, right? A lot of the things I, th I hear like act in there, self-compassion, mm -hmm. some of the cognitive behavioral stuff, sort of a jumping off point or maybe a, uh, changing the subject a little bit from learning how to respond. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, maybe we can linger on that. So sure. in this learning to respond, yeah, the, the mindfulness component certainly is so useful. Mm -hmm. Can you tie in, I'm also looking at the time too. Yeah, it's all good. Can you good. tie in, yeah, the the spirituality component. I love that you you write in the book, having to get to a point to give yourself permission to write about spirituality because of yeah. all the kind of connotations that yeah. come with that. Uh, and I, I love spiritual practices. Uh, I probably learned most of it through AA, really, mm -hmm. which is a spiritual yeah. program, not a yes. religious one, which I yeah. think you point out in the book too, that yes. idea. Yeah. Can you maybe 
talk about how the your spiritual experience or even in the research or mm-hmm. your book how that fits into resilience and wellness and learning to mm-hmm. respond maybe in a way that's more conducive to our values yes absolutely so um so I'll share with you as I was you know getting into this research I have always felt um, as a scholar that there was this expectation that I wasn't able to talk openly about being like a faith-based person Mm -hmm. or someone who has spiritual practices because somehow being a scientist precludes you from being spiritual. And it's almost as if they are meant to be these separate entities or these separate camps. And if you're a spiritual person, then you can't possibly be a scientist. And if you're a scientist, you can't be a spiritual person. Mm -hmm. And one of the beautiful things for me is I remember in my own educational experience, uh, working, um, and meeting actually a, a physicist and he's literally the most brilliant physicist in the world. Like he just blew my mind away how talented and gifted this professor was. And I remember having this moment when I saw him at my church Right. And I ha- I remember having this like wild, like just this moment of just being like, ha- wow, this is the first time those two like competing universes collided. And I just remember just being so awe inspired. And I remember then going out and learning about sign of these ideas about how we can be scientists who also are OK with the mysteries of the world. And mm-hmm. where do we kind of reconcile that disconnect? And I knew very quickly when I was writing about resiliency and stress management and stressing wisely that I would be remiss if I didn't talk about spirituality because for so many persons, that is where we find safety. That is where we find our refuge. That's where we find rest. And what I really came out of that research area learning was it doesn't matter what you believe. And there's so many different variations on themes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's these ideas of these like core guiding values or these principles about being of service, about having a humble heart, about forgiving, about love, about compassion. Those are universal across those different practices. And so for me, again, I would have been remiss if I didn't write that chapter on spirituality. And it was it was hard to write knowing that in yeah. you know 2023, this is a very polarizing topic. Yet it's the truest thing that we learned about wellness is that people who are well they have, they, they trust, they have faith that it all works out. And one of the little pieces though, I I really find it so important to share is I don't believe everything happens for a reason. And I know so often when we're going through, you know, health journeys and recoveries and wellness, we, we want to make meaning and think like all of this served a purpose. Some Mm -hmm. things just suck. Some things are horrible. And I came upon that having supported parents who going through a natural disaster lost their children. And you can't tell me sitting with a grieving parent that all of this happens for a reason because some things are just horrific. It's what do we do with those experiences? And when people find that sense of purpose and values and are driven in that kind of altruistic way to find healing and recovery, that's a pretty beautiful thing to witness. And people can be very, very well, despite having gone through some pretty horrible things. Yeah, there's a lovely idea in self-compassion practice. We bring ourselves compassion not to feel better, but because we feel bad. Yeah. And that sort of sounds a little bit like you're describing that. Just honoring the suffering because it is, because it's here Mm -hmm. and we don't need to pretend that there's a reason for it or that there's sunny days ahead, although that may Mm -hmm. come later, whatever. Are you familiar with, as I understand it, there's research that suggests sort of non-religious societies. So secular societies have higher levels of happiness than religious ones. And religious people in secular societies have better mental health and well-being than secular people in secular societies. Have you heard yeah, of that? Before? Yeah, there's so much research. Is Unfortunately, right? some's complementary, some is, you know, okay. kind of use it differently. But but what we actually found is when it came to wellness, yeah. people who had some form of a spiritual or religious practice were mm-hmm. able 
to be able to weather far more difficult scenarios and situations. They were able to find relief. They were able to find healing and recovery in a very unique way to the point where we couldn't exclude it. Like there, there is something there. And, you know, even as I shared at the beginning, when we were chatting about my really tumultuous teenagerhood, um, the fact that I was rescued from my car accident. And again, I talk openly in lots of different places about what that looked like. But there's, there's no, there's no way that I can't believe that that miracle was already in motion. Like that person who saved my life was already driving that road. He was the person who was going to be able to be part of my recovery by choosing to get involved. And he rescued me, saved my life. And again, I, that's not by chance. And so I think when we kind of take a step back and just realize that all of this is interconnected and there's probably more things that we don't know about our wellness then we do know about it, where I think is a good starting point is to recognize how we feel it shows it really impacts how we show up in our lives. And the better we feel, the better we're able to show up in our lives for ourselves and others and in community. Yeah, that's I wish I could pick your brain for longer. <laughs> the the that the story of the car I one just generally curious Sure. Did you stay in touch with that person? I mean, that must oh. have been such an incredible relationship or just mm-hmm. when you think about that, I mean, there's not much more unbelievable than that, something like that happening. And yeah. maybe if you could try to tie in uh, how our sort of rationalistic, egoic, materialistic sort of thinking brain gets in the way of us opening to the idea of spiritual stuff. Yeah, no, it's it's a beautiful question. Um, So in terms of the relationship with Joseph, um, my family kept in touch with Joseph after the accident, and um, and and eventually, you know, he was a very humble person. He was awarded the Governor General's Award in Canada for risking his life to save a civilian, a stranger, uh, which is the highest accommodation for bravery. So there was a lot of recognition and connection um, afterwards, uh, which was so beautiful to see. Um, And out of respect, I think we we both then kind of went on our way. Um, Mm -hmm. Actually about, uh, I think it was about um, a few years ago though, um, we did later learn that uh, one of the women that worked at the school where all three of our children attended was Mm -hmm. actually a relative of Joseph. And, uh, and she'd been sharing some updates about kind of the the children and, you know, subsequent my future that he made possible uh, because Mm -hmm. of his efforts that evening. So there was a wee bit of a connection there. In terms of your your second question about kind of like, you know, kind of what gets in the way, that kind of idea of like, why can't we choose to believe it's, there's a component of, of, of trust and right. it's trusting uh, ourselves, it's trusting the world. Um, we have to essentially be able to, you know, lean into that discomfort of not knowing but trusting that it's all going to be okay. And again, that's not being naive. It's just trusting yeah. whatever comes your way that you have the capacity to be able to manage it. And one of the things I love to tell teenagers that I get to work with, especially teenagers that are are really struggling is, is the idea that like they're their, they're their own author. Like they get to decide where do I go next? What's my next right move? And we jokingly talk about like, player one energy, right? Like I want you to be player one in your life. I want main character energy. You are not a secondary character in your own life. And I think all of us as grownups too can trust that, you know, we can take some of that main character energy and then realize that nobody's meant to do it alone. So even as we boldly go into these futures, and again, that extreme ownership of showing up, we have that kind of idea that we trust, that we're well-equipped, we're well-resourced, and that the world is working for us, not against us. Mm-hmm. And we can call that faith. You can call it re- you know, religion, Shit, spirituality, yeah. Yeah. but it's ultimately trusting that the world is a good place. Oh, thank you. That's a lovely place to finish. Oh. I want to thank you. So the book is Stress Wisely, How to Be Well in an Unwell World. And Dr. Robin Hanley Defoe, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and great work with us. Any last, all your info and stuff like that will be in the show notes where people can find you. But if you want to direct anybody to your work or anywhere, where where can they go? 
Yeah. So the, again, thank you for including that in the show notes, mm. the website, social media, you're welcome to reach out. Um, and again, thank you, Mike, for opening the door for mm. these conversations. I hope we can, we can have many more of them. So take good care yeah, and thank me you. Me too. Me too. Okay. Thank you so much, Robin. You're welcome. Okay. Take care. 